we know these hormones. We had them on the last test. Epinephrine definitely increases heart rate and force of contraction. Norepinephrine does too. Thyroxin can as well. We know this because we remember hyperthyroidism, which is excessive thyroid hormone, which is also called thyroxin, caused somebody's heart rate to go up and their body temperature to go up. Do you guys remember that? So it's stimulatory. That's just rehashing old stuff. I think it makes sense that you got to have proper ion concentrations for the heart to contract properly because depolarization and repolarization in the plateau phase are all about ions. So specifically here, calcium and potassium they're talking about. See, these are chemical regulators of heart rate. What we did prior to this was nervous system regulators. And look here. Age, gender, exercise, and body temperature all play a role in the heart rate. The one, the two that I want to focus on really, the bottom here. As you exercise, what happens to body temperature? It goes up and the actual warming causes the heart to contract faster. They use the opposite in surgery nowadays. Sometimes they'll cool a patient off to slow the heart rate and to decrease the metabolic needs of the tissue, which is pretty cool. So if your body temperature is low, it would lower your heart rate a bit. When you get a fever, your heart rate would typically go up because of that temperature. And that's cool for exercise because when you warm up, your heart rate goes up just because of the warming, plus it's going up because of other reasons as well. If it's above 100, we call that tachycardia. And if it, the heart rate, is lower than 60, we call it bradycardia. I bet most of you learned that in medical terminology. Notice that bradycardia is actually a good thing if you have it all the time and if you're in shape. When you exercise, you work your heart, it gets in better shape. It pumps more effectively. It doesn't need to beat as many times to get the same work done. So your resting heart rate would be lower. However, if you take somebody who normally has a heart rate of 80 and all of a sudden you drop it to 50, they're not going to feel right. Okay? Because their heart's not pumping effectively at 50 to satisfy the needs, more than likely. And that leads us to the disease, or the condition, I should say, called congestive heart failure. Just to show a hand, how many people have never heard of this? See, everybody's heard of it. Now raise your hand if you can tell me what it is without reading it. It's one of those things that we've all heard of, but we don't understand. It's so simple. It's a condition in which the output of blood, the heart's pumping, it doesn't pump enough to satisfy your tissue's needs. Okay, let's visualize that. Heart pushes blood out. Blood spreads through the body. It goes to the capillaries. It sends nutrients and oxygen and water and all kinds of stuff to the tissues to feed them. But if your heart can't pump properly and not enough new blood is pushed out there, then your tissue needs are not met. A condition where the cardiac output is so low that blood circulation is inadequate to meet tissue needs is congestive heart failure. And it usually gets worse and worse and worse. That's why they say it's a progressive condition. Notice, first one. So we have to know what all these things are. Coronary means heart atherosclerosis. Plaquing. When you have plaques in the blood vessels of the heart, you're just not going to get proper nutrients to the heart. The heart's not going to be as strong. It won't pump as effectively. So plaquing of blood vessels. Persistent high blood pressure. What's persistent? It means pretty much most of the time, all the time. 
That doesn't mean you exercise, your blood pressure goes up. That means you just have high blood pressure as a condition. We just learned when the blood pressure goes up, your heart has to pump harder. It wears it out. Over time, long-term high blood pressure wears out your heart. It just gets tired, and it can't pump as effectively. Multiple myocardial infarctions. Those are heart attacks. In the lab, it teaches you how to define them. It's the area of heart muscle that has died because of lack of oxygen. Well, if you have a heart attack, that means part of the heart muscle has died. It can never heal itself. That's the way it works. You don't grow new heart muscle. Once it's dead, it's dead. So that part of the heart, if it's really small, it would turn into connective tissue and just not contract. The rest of your heart could still contract. It could still push blood out, and you can survive that. If you have another one and another one and another one, more and more and more areas die off, and eventually it gets to where the heart can't pump effectively. Okay? And a dilated cardiomyopathy, I'm guessing very few people have heard of that. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Perfect score this week. Nobody in any class had ever heard of that. All right. Dilated means? It's enlarged. But it doesn't mean thick. It means ballooned out. Okay? This is when the chambers become large because the muscle around them becomes weak. So they get weak and they get distended. And that weak heart muscle is flabby and floppy and doesn't push right. Okay? The walls actually will wiggle and not push right. Well, obviously that's a bad thing. And that is chapter 18.